Ani, hello, and welcome to the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indians Native Cinema Showcase. I would like to gratefully acknowledge the Native peoples whose ancestral homelands we gather, as well as the diverse and vibrant Native communities who make their home here today. My name is Cass Gardner. I am an Anishinaabe Kwe from Kebawak First Nation in what is now called Temiskaming, Quebec. I am also a filmmaker, curator, writer, and your moderator today. Our panel, A Different Lens, focuses on women and two-spirited peoples who have always occupied a special role in indigenous societies celebrated for their ability to see the world differently. We are lucky to be joined by three prominent filmmakers who are utilizing a different lens to tell indigenous stories. I will let my filmmakers introduce themselves. We will start with Tracy, then Hina, and finally, Adriana. Adriana, sorry. <laughs> Hi everyone, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here and having this conversation. I am a Mohawk writer, director, showrunner, and I have a film at the festival this year called Beans that I'm so thrilled to have uh, out in the world for, for people to see. Thanks for having me. Aloha, my name is Hinale Moana Wang Kalu, and I am from the islands of Hawaii and my film is Kapai Mahu, and it speaks about those whom are in the middle and those whom come from both male and female spirit. Hi, I'm Adriana Otero. I'm from Yucatan, Mexico. And um, in this showcase, I have two films. I have Snake's Mouth and What Happened to the Beast. And the, the works that I have direct have focus on talking about issues that occurs in Mayan communities in Yucatan with topics um, such as the defense of the territory, um, the protection of the environment and the ways of life of the main characters of the stories in the films that, are, that I have done. Thank you for the invitation. Of course. Okay, let's kick things off. Um, I'd like to start with Hina, if that's okay. Um, so in your film, the main characters are people who are mahu, both people who are have male and female in them. Can you talk a little bit more about that and why you felt called to share this story in particular? Yes, mahalo. The film Kapai Mahu speaks of four healers that came from the ancestral homelands of my people. For those of us who call ourselves Kanaka or Kanaka Maoli, uh, to the rest of you out there in the larger world, you know us as Hawaiians. And my people come from <clears throat> a, a myriad of understandings that tend to differ with the Western lens of looking at life and people who are dual in spirit. We are called Mahu and our place is recognized. Our place is prominent in that we are given responsibilities that will span both male and female. And in this film, it is about healing. And I am prompted to bring this to you because the Americanization and colonization of my islands and my people has resulted in the near erasure of my culture and the, the near extinction of my language. And so it is incumbent upon myself and anyone else in my community to do all that we can to bring our history forward and to make sure that there's something left for the generations to come. Yeah, definitely. Um, do you think that there was a reason, um, or like it's it's especially timely in uh, the last few years to have this film out? Or um, I guess it's always timely because colonization always is present. But <laughs> yes, well, <clears throat> so for two primary reasons. Again, the first one is from the coming of foreigners to the 
uh, invasion of my islands by U.S. troops here. And so many different points of history along the way. We see how my people have suffered at the hands of foreigners here. And, and one of the um, most salient of those things is that our language, our history, and our knowledge of who we are is always, always either compromised, threatened, or capitalized upon to our detriment. And it couldn't be more timely that we are able to bring this history forward in this time of global pandemic where many people around the world are either suffering or seeing the, their loved ones suffer. And so this story of healing will hopefully bring hope to those who watch it. Yes, it was beautiful. It was um, such a great film. The animation and the story itself, I'm curious what you feel the power of making old stories new again, because that's it's uh, it's framed as sort of um, an oral history um, in the past tense. So um, how do you yeah, how do you feel about stories from the past and their ability to transform the future in the present day? Yes. Thank you. The, the story Kapaima who brings forward just a, a touch of the Hawaiian understanding of the world of LGBT to Americans and to other foreigners abroad. The LGBT perspective is, uh, the, the topic of LGBT is looked at very differently from how we here in the Pacific view this. And so <clears throat> in an effort to bring this understanding forward, this is nothing new to us in the Pacific. And um, the, for example, the understanding of the they, them, theirs pronoun that has come about in more recent times I come from a people whose language already has it built in. Our word for he, for she, and for it is only one word, and it's Oya. And unlike uh, European-based languages, our language has no gender attached to it. And we have terminology that speaks to different relationships, terminology that speaks to different people. So... <clears throat> I really appreciate what film has done for my ability to not necessarily bring something new, but allowing my people's history to shape how we in our, in my islands see ourselves. And hopefully when my people apply this to our daily lives, we might find ourselves in just that much little better a place than we might have been yesterday and the day before. Thank you. That's really beautiful. Um, it it is it that like look. Sometimes when we see historical things, I feel like it allows us to see. It gives us a bit of a measuring stick sometimes to see like how far we've come, or sometimes how like how much work we still have to do, and it's um, you know. For what it's worth, it can be, you know, empowering or disheartening, sometimes both. And it makes me think, Tracy, of your film, Beams, because you um, did also do something similar with looking at kind of the historical and in this instance, the Oka crisis. And um, I rewatched it. So I watched it now. I've had the pleasure of watching it twice now. <laughs> and um, it just, it always is it's so powerful because it is through the eyes of a young girl um, who's coming of age in a time in which the country is kind of having to reconcile um, its past as well. So is there, did you always want to make a story about the Oka crisis and frame it through your experience and through a young girl's eyes? Yes. Yes. This, this film is actually the ultimate passion project for me. I, wanted to become a filmmaker when I was 12 years old. And I lived through this uprising when I was 12 years old. And, and really that summer marked 
when I began to understand what it means to be an Indigenous person in this country and in this world. Um, I never, at the time, I, I never thought, it really felt like an impossible dream to tell this story because we weren't seeing ourselves on screen. As a 12 year old, I didn't think I would get to grow up and become a filmmaker and tell our own stories. So that, that was, that was something discovered as I, as I grew up and, and here in Canada, we have the Aboriginal people's television network, which is content by indigenous people for indigenous people. And that just blew my world. Um, and I have been uh, fortunate enough to be telling stories about our own people for the last 20 years. And that's when it, it, it became, it became a reality in my mind that maybe this dream I had ever since I was 12 to tell the story from the point of view of a 12 year old, my point of view, um, that this, this could actually happen. And it's taken the time it's taken to get this story out there, even though I've really been wanting to tell it for 30 years because it was very scary. It was a very scary story to tell on so many different levels. And I think it's taken the time to develop my voice, develop my confidence as a filmmaker, as a storyteller, to be able to say everything I wanted to say with it. So yes, 30, 30 years in the making um, to get to this moment. No small feet. <laughs> um, and it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's just so empowering too to see female characters, female coming of age stories. They're not the dominant narrative, especially I feel like the Okra crisis, this film could have been made easily from the perspective of the people on the front lines, but there is some, there's just a different layer of context, seeing it through the eyes of a young girl and a child and how that shapes a person. And, spoilers and when she's in the school I mean she has such confidence and purpose to be there um because she knows kind of what's at stake and has made that decision um and that makes me think um Adriana of your film which in um uh Boco de Colu Colibre the snake's mouth um I'll print it I'll butcher the Spanish so don't worry um We'll both be uncomfortable <laughs> speaking our non-native tongues. Um, so in that film, that also features a young woman who is on the precipice of a decision um, whether to stay or or go. And I was just wondering how you um, how you met your characters and how you arrived at telling this story. Sure. Um... In the case of Snake's Mouth, um, it was very nice because everything was a, a discovery um, from the story uh, of the town to the decision of um, to speak about a family and after to speak um, to a, um, a specific person. So um, when I went to that community uh, where I already knew a little about their history. Um, I thought, okay, maybe everyone here speaks um, the language that I have no idea and uh, how to communicate with them, what I'm going to do now. So um, the reality is that currently not the entire population of, of that community is deaf. Um, there are many people who speak Spanish. So the first thing I did was uh, go to a store to buy some snacks. And um, there I asked to a woman who, whose name was um, Adriana. She um, unfortunately passed away a year ago. And she told me that her sister's family were all deaf which I found very interesting. And I asked if uh, I could uh, meet them. And we went the same day and it was um, as we had met before. They were very kind to me and with the support of Adriana, we uh, talked a bit about um, 
what they were doing and I told them my interest to, my interest to uh, talk about life in Chican. Chican is the name uh, of the town. And I remember I showed them um, a piece of uh, what happened to the bees. So uh, they agreed to participate and I think I did uh, two more visits before starting to film. They invited me to it. They showed me how to make hammocks and I um, accompany each other in different activities to know about them a little more. And um, well, with the, the helis causing, the, um, we were be able to communicate. So I think um, everything was uh, built from sincerity and friendship. To this day, Jelly, uh, Heli and I text each other and send, I don't know, stickers and emojis on WhatsApp. So uh, we become friends. We became friends, and it was a. a, a I think it was natural, and yes, um, we we have a, a, a great friendship right now. Oh, that's great! <laughs> I'm happy to hear that. And is she doing well on the outside world? Yes, yes. Um, she, she's, she's good. Um, she uh, got married. Um, oh, wow. Yes. But um, f- um, because of the COVID, I can't um, visit her. But um, we are in touch uh, in Facebook or WhatsApp. Oh, great. That's awesome. <laughs> Send her my congratulations. Sure. Uh, thanks. <laughs> No, of course. I th- like hearing everybody's things. It makes me think of um, a conversation that I had uh, back in probably the winter. And it had actually been Tracy. We were talking about beans and you had said how um, not only like it was important for different stories to be um to make different kinds of stories on screen, but also the production process directing behind the camera and how you on Beans had really went in with the intention of directing in a style that is more um, decidedly female. And I was wondering if you could elaborate more about that because I didn't get a chance to ask you before, but now I'm going to. (laughs) Absolutely. Um, I think that was the biggest challenge that I and the team had to take on, you know, the film itself, there's, there's a lot going on, but I didn't want to make this film at any cost. Um, It was recreating the most traumatic moments of my life and the devastating effect that those moments had on me. But I did not want to pass on that trauma to our young cast or, or any of any of the crew or extras we were working with or re-traumatize anyone because a lot of all of our Mohawk extras had all lived through the Oka crisis as well. So the task before us was how do we do this, um, have fun every single day and still get all the pieces we needed that then when pieced together later is a true representation of this, of this horrible summer that can have an impact on, on an audience. And I will, I will very, I will try to be as brief as possible because there's so many different things we did to make that possible. Um, one, all of the historical recreation recreations we did of, of these uh, racially charged, hateful events, we didn't do them in the communities that they happened. So I, I wasn't interested in reopening wounds within these specific communities because we have worked 30 years to repair those relationships. So we went a good 45 minutes to 50 minutes outside of the communities. And for for me, it was also important that we had um, informed consent from everyone. So these communities that we went to to film these racially charged, horrific events, I didn't want us to sneak in there and 
and film it without their knowledge. So everyone knew what we wanted to do, why we were doing it. They, they, a lot of people hold details back about their film. You know, they're very secretive. That was not our case. It's, it's an event that happened 30 years ago. So what's the big surprise there? Um, so we were, we were very open about everything we were setting out to do and why we were doing it. And it was really amazing to have these communities, these outside communities come on board in the spirit of reconciliation, wanting to do what they can to be a part of, of, of a new relationship with Indigenous people. Um, so that was really incredible. Um, it was the same kind of informed consent with all of the extras who had to come in and play these racists. I didn't want anyone showing up and being surprised at what was being asked of them. You needed, I wanted people to be prepared to go to those dark places all day. Um, so again, it was informed consent when we were booking them to let them know what we were doing, why we needed them to do it. Um, every day at the beginning of the day, I met with those extras. I gave them the context of what the event was about, the effect it had on me, what and what I needed from them. And I needed them while we were filming to go as dark as they possibly could. But as soon as we yelled cut, I needed them to come back to who they are authentically and bring as much positivity to that set as they can, because in the numbers that we had them, you know, 50, 75, 100, their attitude sort of really would set the tone for the entire team. And they really, really delivered. These extras um, brought so much positivity um, and love for for the, the young cast, but also for all of our Mohawk extras. It was a really supportive environment. Um, <laughs> When we were shooting these difficult scenes, we also had support for anyone who needed it. We had three Indigenous social workers with us. We had a PTSD specialist with us. Um, you never know when when something might be triggered and we wanted that support to be there. I had my own moment um, on set. I had a few moments on set where, um, you know, PTSD did did hit and I had to step away. and take a few breaths, I had to cry. And all of that was, was it was an emotionally safe set. Let me say that. Um, if we needed to cry, we cried. If we hugged, we hugged. This was of course pre-COVID where we could hug. And I'm so grateful we could because those hugs are important. Um, it, was a, it, was, it was a real beautiful tight-knit family. Mm -hmm. for, for the kids, we had an acting coach for all of the emotionally difficult scenes, because it really is, it's a skill as an actor to be able to prepare emotionally, do the scene and then come right back to who you are. And all of our young actors are young actors and some of them were doing it for the first time. So they didn't have those tools already in their tool belt. So we wanted to make sure they had those resources. And after a difficult scene, I had to move on to, to get ready for the next scene. So even though I would want to be there supporting them, I had to keep moving. So the acting coach was there to take care of them after a scene. We, we had dance parties for them. We had arts and crafts for them. We had all things that would bring joy and bring them back to who they are after filming a difficult scene. We had body doubles in place. Um, so that whenever, whenever possible, uh, the body doubles would step in. And for Beans in particular, her body double was a woman. So I wasn't substituting one young girl for another young girl. It was a woman who was stepping in to do, the, do these tougher stunts. And at the end of the film, there is a scene of sexual violence. And it, it's between these two teenage actors and... I did not want them to have to do that scene together. So we also employed our shooting techniques, which allowed us to, again, use these body doubles. So our young 12 year old actually shot that scene against a woman who was filling in for the teenage boy. And then likewise, the teenage boy shot his part of the scene with the beans double, who was also a grown woman. And we had an intimacy coordinator with us lots of rehearsals leading up. So everyone knew every single thing that would happen. They had practiced it. They were comfortable with it. And you also do as, as, as least amount of takes as possible. So let's get in, let's get in 
and let's get out as quick as possible. There's no, there's no, you know, seven setups and five angles. It's let's get what we need to tell this to tell the story and let's get out as quick as possible. And we did that with not just with that scene, with the sexual violence scene, but that was my approach with with the film in 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 general. I wanted to really stay with her and and that allowed us to not have to cover it from 10 different angles. I wasn't interested in in the perspective of the cop across the way or the perspective of the angry mob. I wanted to stay with her. And so if you if you if you look at the film and um, break down each scene, you'll see that there's there's really not a lot of shots per scene. Um, and and many of the shots with the kids, we separated it from the violence that was happening. So the kids, they have their own shot. I, to, I, I would tell them what is going on around them. They would use their imagination. They would play pretend. They would act, which is exactly what the job is. You do not have to be exposed to that to deliver the performance needed. Um, and then the kids would go back to base camp in their trailers for the dance party. And then we would shoot the violence without them. And they only saw it all pieced together when the film was was cut together as a whole. So that that's a lot. Um, there's probably a few more examples, but um, those are those are a bunch of the things that we we did in making this film. Wow, that is just a Herculean effort in itself. But like the thing that jumps out at me is just the amount of care and the removal of ego from the director, because I feel like, you know, most of our directors identify as male and cis and hetero. And are there's a lot of an, there's a lot of an ego dance usually in the directorial role. And um, it seems from what you're saying that, yeah, it was a lot of thinking about others, putting others needs first, which I feel like is generally a more feminine or feminine identified trait. Um, and so I think that that it, it just makes it does speak volumes about the film, too. It's and obviously you, Tracy, but it, it, there's just so much care and thought put into what goes on behind the scene. And then you get a great product in front of the camera as well. So, I mean, I just hope that that's maybe the benchmarker for everyone making films in the future, that we can all really put others needs in front of us and also realize you know, I always think it's, it's, it's a movie, you know, we don't have to hurt ourselves to make a movie. We don't have to put other people in danger or in therapy because we made a film. And, um, absolutely. So that's just great. Did you come up with those resources on your own or did you brainstorm them with like other people who kind of done that before? Cause I don't think I've ever heard a lot of those strategies employed in filmmaking. No, we, we, I mean, as a team, we would, we would brainstorm and figure out how do we, how do we want to do this? Um, I will say that I did come to the table with this requirement mm -hmm. and my producing team, you know, got on board and I think at times was a little frustrated, but it was absolutely important to me and, and we fig you know, we figured it out. And they they followed my lead, um, which which I'm so grateful for. And and I, I feel a, I feel a little bit spoiled in that way. I I, I can't imagine doing it any other way, uh, where I can't call those kinds of shots. Um, you know, I I want to have I want to have fun. I I always connect back to the 12 year old in me who dreamed of becoming a filmmaker. I mean, we get to do, this is just such incredible work and we, we, our work can have such an impact in the world, but if it's been this terrible experience creating that work, I don't know that the impact is as important if we have harmed um, or if we have been miserable the entire time and dragged people along with us, I'm not interested in that experience. So it was finding finding the way, and I did hit resistance. I and I would say from some of the men on the team, who it seemed at times weren't actually hearing me; mm. they would just be staring at me and sort of, you know, fake listening, and then 
once I was done, they would say, well, if you want my opinion, I think we should do it just like we should do it the way it's always been done. And if that doesn't work, we can explore other ways. And I would just sit back and look at him, him specifically, one guy and think, have you not heard everything I've just said and why I want to do this this way? Um, and it did get to a point where I knew it wasn't, it was, we were not going to do something safe together. So I fired him. Good for you. <laughs> That's great. Hina, is this resonating with you at all? I feel like um, obviously not directly the same, but I can imagine as a um, indigenous director um, embodying two spirits. Is that the correct term? I'm, I'm using it. It's a, that's a Canadian term. So I apologize if that's not the right word, but I'd love to be educated on a better one if you have one that's more appropriate for how you identify. Um, my friends and family, they, <clears throat> they apply the pronoun as would be consistent with somebody of my age. Um, so they say she and her, but I know that the younger people now are going to, are more okay with living that place in the middle rather than trying to push to one side or the other. Mm -hmm. um, through this film that I've been a part of, it did teach me much in the way of accepting this very broad and encompassing space of being in the middle and to harness both male and female. Mm -hmm. And when I think about myself, um, I'm probably at this point in my personal and professional journey, rather astute at harnessing both female and male. Because I can tell the difference when I sit in a room or a Zoom with men and then with women. Um, and, I'll, and either way, I'll still feel just a slight bit different, which is neither bad nor good. It can only be used to inform. It can only be used to empower. Um, I commend those of you who are here and those of you who will watch this, that if you are on your journey of empowerment, may you come to full fruition in who you are, whether you are male or female or both. And at the end of our day, may we strive to find balance in our life. I think that is the key. In working with the people that I've worked with, I've had to put my voice much more forward so that I'm not the token brown person, but I'm actually active in saying what is appropriate for myself and my people and the story that we are um, and you know that we endeavor to to tell and my two colleagues that uh you know are part of this team they are uh two caucasian men so it gets quite interesting sometimes because i too will have to step myself up and say exactly how i feel and there are times where that that same kind of um how do i say it i'm not sure what the english word is for it but i know there's one where well let's you know let's explore and then uh, let's explore these ways and if it doesn't work then i'm very thankful for working with the people that at one time i would never ever have worked with two caucasian men ever because I come from the background that I was taught to, to hate them. And I was taught to never, ever work with them. But I understand that in doing so, 
There's much for me to learn. And there's much for me to address in terms of bringing greater balance to my canoe that's sailing on the ocean. Mm. That's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, no. Yes, I think there's there's definitely value in having our spaces, and there's there's also value in um, finding those allies who who do want to walk with us in a good way. It's more of a Canadian phrase. I think we always say do things in a good way, but I think it translates across um, cultures and countries in the sense that like, like you're, like you're all saying the important thing is to do no harm. Um, not intentionally. Okay. Speaking of, um, so yeah, it's very important also that we include our allies in um, the filmmaking process. And Adriana, I would consider you a great ally for um, indigenous filmmaking because your film was so, it just felt very respectful. And quite honestly, I thought it was from um, someone who was indigenous when I first watched it because you had, I, I feel like the the way that you made the film in the voice of the, and for documentary as well, I felt like it was so interesting how you chose to make the documentary um, about this young girl, but the whole thing was in her voice and she was speaking for herself. Um, so I was just wondering if you have anything to add also about, you know, working in collaboration as a woman behind the camera with another young woman um, across cultures and if there's any you'd like to add about that. Um, sure. Um, well, the decision to focus um, on, on Heli was uh, because when I met the family, uh, it was with, with Heli that I identified the most. We are uh, women, young people with many dreams and uh, because we are two people who believe that we, we doesn't have to follow the family traditions. And if that is not um, our wish, so we somehow um, share that. And when I decide that the main character would be Heli, I stay more with her and I work with Heli and her cousin and Delmi in writing the script about um, what, what she told me, um, what she had lived and what she wanted to do with her life. And through uh, her daily activities, I thought of those images in which um, we could see Heli's feelings. Um, and yeah, um, I, I worked that with, with her and well, um, the music and the sounds helped to enter into that feeling um, of of the mysticism of the, of the town, but as well um, to the mind of Ellis. So, and and yes, uh, the, the the most um, difficult thing of doing this film was the communication. But with the support of Delmi, we 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 can uh, do that. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Um, unfortunately, I think our time today has come to an end. I'd like to open up the space if anyone has anything that they'd like to say or hasn't been touched upon before we leave. I mean, there's so much, there's so much more to say, um, but we. I know we don't have the space, but I so appreciate sharing space with with you incredible women and being able to talk about our passion and talk about our communities it's been amazing so thank you thank you for having me mahalo mahalo anui kato hui ana mahalo ni ya uto no te yalo na ana me kato tuta tuta ana i epiliana no i te kato mau papana mahalo aloha Thank you to everyone. Um, I'm so glad to, to be here with you and to know about your, um, your process. 
and thank you um, the people who see our films um, and and that's all I I hope that you are fine and I send hugs from Mexico thank you so much everybody